Earlier, as you were talking, Zach, I was just listening to this story you're telling, and I became conscious of the fact that I said, that's pretty cool. And then 10 seconds later, I was just thinking in my head, that's like the biggest understatement of the year. (laughs) that everything that we know about these like human origins and my response was that's pretty cool no it's amazing Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's so amazing that we can know any of these things so i just want to correct for my understatement and recognize how incredible it is that we know all of these things You are listening to the Down the Wormhole podcast, exploring the strange and fascinating relationship between science and religion. This week, our hosts are Zach Jackson, UCC pastor in Reading, Pennsylvania, and my ideal habitat is nestled in the side of a mountain with a fire and no one around for miles, but yet there's also Wi-Fi. Rachel Jackson, rabbi at Agudas Israel Congregation, Hendersonville, North Carolina. My ideal habitat would be space. Being able to go wherever, whenever. Of course, you know, still being alive and being able to breathe and stuff. But, you know, bouncing from comet to planet to to anything. I think that would be unbelievable. Kendra Holtmore, PhD student at Boston University. And my ideal habitat would be a black hole because I want to see what's going on in there. Oh, past the event horizon. (laughs) Ian Benz, Associate Professor of Elementary Science Education at UMC Charlotte. And my ideal habitat would be probably the mountains, maybe specifically the Alps. But just as long as I can have a lightsaber. Because wherever I go, if, if I could have an ideal setting, I have to have my Star Wars lightsaber. So, so. This is like a Hoth kind of situation for you. As long as it looks like the Alps, yes. The question was ideal location, not ideal weapon. Just Thank FYI. you, Kendra. I know that, but I'm throwing in that because that's part of my ideal location. <laughs> well, you can keep your weapon for another question. <laughs> okay. You can still well, keep it in there, though, for you. because it's, the movie's coming out soon. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you. What's your question, Zach? My question is, you know, with all of this talk about the beginnings of things and the slow, gradual growth of complex species and on Earth and extinctions and the new species coming up and all of these kinds of conversations we've been having, at what point did religion start. Uh, If you read any religious text, you would believe that that particular religion was the first religion. Almost every one of our religions today and back then have an origin story that's kind of important to most religions, and most people put themselves in that origin story. So presumably Adam and Eve in the Judeo-Christian tradition, they lived in the Fertile Crescent, so somewhere in the Middle East, despite the fact that, you know, biologically, we know that the human species grew up in Africa. You look at, you know, across the across the ocean, over here in North and South America, their, their creation myths had the world starting there. The the native peoples where, where I live right now, the Lenni Lenape, their name, I believe, means the first peoples. And they believed themselves to be the original humans, and all other humans came from them. And, huh. you know, I wasn't there. I don't know. That might be true. We might have the whole migration thing backwards. But it has been a question that's kind of stuck in my head for some time. And I think we'll get further into this in a in an episode in a couple of weeks about whether it was technology and cities that created religion as we know it today, or if it was religion that enabled the development of cities and technology, which, you know, teaser is a great question and is a lot of fun. Which came first, big God or big city? There you go. I have an answer, but I won't spoil it. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm sure I have the opposite answer. To be continued in a That's few That's what minutes. I would expect from you two. <laughs> no one is surprised. So all of this discussion, though, that I have inside of my head and through my frantic 2 a.m. Wikipedia searches is predicated on Homo sapiens. And in particular, you know, kind of more Bronze Age Homo sapiens. But what about the Stone Age? What about before recorded history? What about other than Homo sapiens? When is the first time that anything we might call religion or spirituality or some organized way of communing with a divine being rears its head? It's difficult to assess, obviously, because as a part of being prehistory is they're not writing stuff down yet. This is before written language, so not a whole lot survives. And what does survive, we have to interpret. But uh, you can you can look at those beautiful cave paintings in in France that um, it's like the Sistine Chapel with a lot of these where where they've they've gone deep down into a cave and found some huge vaulted ceiling and then painted the whole thing images of of animals and. Uh, what appear to be in in some of these caves uh, places of sacrifice or uh, at least of coal. Um, my favorite one is in, and I'm I'm I hate myself that I can't think of the exact cave. I'll have to look this up and put it in the show notes. That there is a an impression left in the ground of a young boy and a dog, and I think that's fantastic. That twenty thousand years ago, in some cave in France, there was a boy and his puppy, and you know, oh, yeah. I wish I could bring my puppy to church. But that's Homo sapiens, and that's a whole different story. What about Neanderthals? We don't think about Neanderthals as having religion or culture or anything. Really, we think of them as these brainless brutes with their furrowed brows and me hunter, me ug, me kill. <laughs> But in uh, in Spain, the archaeologists have discovered a series of caves which appear, at least, to date to about 65,000 years ago, which is well before any Homo sapiens came up from Africa and joined their frigid brethren up north. So this is most likely to be a Neanderthal. And they're able to do this by by taking samples of the the area where the cave paintings are, uh, the stone, the rocks behind it, and looking for layers of, of of smoke and of pigment and of rock, and you know doing some carbon dating techniques to try to discover how old exactly there are. But there are caves that we found in Spain that have paintings. There is a grave discovered in France in which there are three males which we have found are from the same matrilineal descent, thanks to the fact that we have sequenced uh, Neanderthal DNA, and three females along with them that are not of that descent. Huh. Which would seem to imply that they were married and they had some kind of social tradition of women marrying into their husband's household. And these were three brothers and their wives. And if that's the case, then we're talking about a people with a social order. And if they have paintings, that means they have some kind of art. And in some of these, there's, there's evidence of beads, of jewelry. They're burying their dead, which why do you bury your dead unless you care about what's happening to them afterwards? We have elderly skeletons that have been discovered with hip and joint problems. You don't have elderly um, gazelle. There aren't really elderly gorilla who have broken and healed bones because they're not taking care of them. The Neanderthals are taking care of each other. In these small but seemingly well-formed societies throughout Europe and then into, into Asia, we see 78% of specimen of Neanderthals show some sign of trauma including broken bones and healed bones, which implies that they were not only hunting dangerous game, but then when they got hurt, they took care of each other. They had some system of 
of a medical practice because they're healed wounds. They didn't just let they didn't just let each other be hurt and then die from that injury. Right. Which so is they have what some... we might see in in mammals. And we now would probably call that morality or something to that effect, or at least yeah. uh, ethical a, treatment. Ethical treatment that they're able to look at another and think of them as if they were thinking of themselves. If they had bigger brains than us, and the same parts that enable our communication were present in theirs. We know that they lived in small tribes, which is probably the reason why we ended up winning. Because Homo sapiens are smaller, we're nakeder, we're weaker. We have smaller brains, but we, for some way, some reason, we can communicate a whole lot better. We can gather in larger groups, you know, whereas a Neanderthal group might take their spears and hunt a woolly mammoth, a Homo sapien group would scare a bunch of them strategically off a cliff. And so they would just do the dirty work themselves and go and harvest all the meat. We were smarter and we worked together, which is probably why we out-competed them and then bred with them. And now every single human except for those born in sub-Saharan Africa have some Neanderthal in them. Some more than others. I <laughs> am one of those people, actually. I have more ne According to... 23 and me. I have more Neanderthal in me than like 89% of the population. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I have about, uh, again, according to 23 and me, I have uh, about half a percent of Neanderthal, and my husband has like 3%. Hmm. So I feel like there's some joke in there that I'm missing. There really must be, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever joke you would make would be offensive to Neanderthals, and I would. Um, you could get upset take, by it. I would take offense to that. And <laughs> yeah. I'd have to defend my my people. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like I need to get 23 in me. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> but uh, Zach, as you were talking, part of what you're referencing when you're when you're listing a few of these things and clearly the majority of information that we have is only accessible through interpretation. What does it mean that a, right? So we find, the evidence is, we find a grave. That is that is as much as we know. How the people got there, why they got there, who they were, how they're related, we're slowly getting to find out, right? That piece, from a DNA perspective at least. But we don't know why they're there. So we're then using our own understanding of what it means to to bury and then looking at other animal species and drawing conclusions based on what other animal species do and what we do. And we then get into this question of at what point is it society and, you know, either morality or ethics? When does that also then lend itself to religion, right? Just because, so if somebody buries their dead, Perhaps that means they have the compassion and the love and the desire not to see that person eaten by scavengers, right? Animal scavengers, right? Or maybe cannibals. We don't really know, right? Cannibalism is still a possibility. So maybe, maybe that's the extent, right? If they take care of this person through their life, wouldn't you also want their body to be taken care of when it was no longer alive? So I think we're we're playing a very fine line there with saying the interpretation of things which to us are ritualistically religious. I don't know if that can then be extrapolated to to these other cultures. The sort of famous example of that is that spread of misinformation that the Neanderthals had this ancient cave bear worship cult. Yeah. And that's derived from a couple of bad interpretations of a few sites. And there's really no good evidence that there was any widespread worship of cave bears or cave bear spirit or whatnot. It's just something we've we've wished were, were obvious and true. But this begs the question, if, if they're not burying their dead for ceremonial or religious reasons, reasons if they don't believe that anything happens after death why bury well i mean 
I think it goes to, say, for example, human beings <clears throat> and the way that we treat non-humanoid creatures. Right? Many of us have pets. Many of us have had pets that have died. Some of us have lived in areas where we can just bury that pet in our backyard. And so if I don't believe that there is a soul or a religious reason to bury my my cat, why would I do that? I I could just as easily dispose of it in the garbage in the garbage, right? Which gets taken away from my property. So what is the value of having that? I think you also don't even need to jump to animals. Like you could still say okay. that about humans, like people who are not religious who who are atheists or whatever, agnostic, still have funerals and still right. do some kind of, right. you know, whether it's like a memorial service and like the way that a funeral is carried out might look differently, but there's still rituals that people participate in to honor the people they love. And mm-hmm. I think you can argue about whether or not that's like inherently religious to some extent, but I think, so yeah, on the one hand, I guess, the ritual itself, you might say, is inherently religious. And it doesn't really matter what you believe happens after death. And if so, then sure, you can you can say that all kinds of things are religious. Um, and an easy example of that is a, a funeral. But I think if it's about what, what you have to believe in addition to these ritual practices, it, it becomes more complicated, I think, to call a funeral religious because people don't necessarily believe that there is a soul or that anything happens after. And it is for many just about like honor and respect and closure mm-hmm. also. Well, yeah. And, and that's, that's the bridge. That's where we go from uh, spirituality to religion when it becomes something that then you have to believe before that. Yeah. It's a spiritual practice. It's it's some kind of transcendental acknowledgement that there's more to a person than just their flesh, that there was something else to them and that we are going to miss them and an acknowledgement of your pain and, and all of that. But the moment you take that and now you say, oh, but now we know they're in uh, Hades or heaven or Valhalla or whatever it is, that's when we're in the territory of religion and we can't prove that about any ancient society that before writing. I'm just trying to imagine that, you know, looking at, let's assume that we have no writing, right? That there's no writing in our day, which is impossible given that there's just tweets being thrown out into the universe left and right. And in 10,000 years, 20,000 years, someone finds our, our society and goes, why is there a cat buried next to a dog and smaller dogs? And well, that one is also buried here, and but there's no humans over here, and over here are the human burials, and that's all we know, right? And and without recognizing any ritual, because there's no writing to indicate what ritual there was, if any, all we see are then the burials, which is the which is what you, the um, the example Zach that you were giving us is just a burial, and to me, just a burial means that we are likely a step up of other animal creatures who do not bury, which indicates an emotional tie to a to another creature, whether that pers- whether that creature is of our of our tribe, of our, our personhood, or in 21st century, how we just absolutely love our pets to the point where some people call them children, right? That these are my this is my dog child. My fur then- baby. My fr- thank you. That's a better term. <laughs> my grand dog, my fur babies, right? That what that tells us is that there's an emotional connection. I think to what happens to the flesh of this creature, but it doesn't give us any understanding of even spirituality, or religion, or ritual. 
So I think the evidence is we are still trying to put our understanding mm-hmm. on those evidence and wanting, wanting that to be like us, right? Because if we can, going back to your point, Zach, our origin story is we were here. And if we can say, look, even with this scientific evidence that shows, you know, that our story might not have been completely accurate, at least these people were just like me. I think there's something very powerful and a a, a base need to say these people were just like me. I think that one way, I guess what what I see you as, may, and maybe you're not trying to say this, Zach, but it seems like uh, one way to make that connection between um, us and them through this use of ritual and specifically like funeral rites is that the evidence of burials and the evidence of like ritual practices maybe signals the capacity for religion. It's not that there's evidence of religiosity, but very good what we it, know yeah. about our own religiosity is that it is this combination of doctrines and practices and and rituals. And so if we see that happening somewhere else, the rituals in and of themselves are not necessarily religious, but it does signal that there's like the potential for it. And I think that's a way to like claim this connection and similarity that I think seems totally fair. But on the other hand, I th- it also makes me wonder about uh, the kinds of, I don't know, maybe we don't want to call them rituals, but practices that a lot of animals also have. Like I'm thinking of like mating practices that on the outside can look very uh, like ritualistic or even like the dance that the honeybees do to communicate like where the pollen is. Like, I don't know if y'all would maybe call those things something else, but I think there's form to those things and uh, a boundedness. Like they last a certain amount of time. They look a certain way. There's like this form and structure that we also see in human rituals and practices. And so I think it becomes complicated even to say that something that looks like ritual indicates um, a capacity for religiosity, because then we have to ask the question, well, does that mean that any animal that does something that looks like a ritual, do they also have this capacity? And so, yeah, I think it, it becomes a really interesting question to kind of speculate about, but Uh, I think in most cases, people would say, no, that's not an indication that the birds who are doing the mating dance, like have religion in the same way that humans do. And so how do we actually like demarcate what ritual and the indication of ritual as religion, like what does that actually mean? Well, it's like, what's the direction of the ritual? Like the honeybee is dancing to another bee to tell them about something else. The, the tropical bird is shaking its butt around to, to get the attention of this other bird. They're doing these, these rituals in order to communicate with another thing. If you're doing a ritual to communicate to something that's not there, or at least that you can't see, I think that's when we get into the realm of spirituality and religion at least from the outside, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah. And which is not something that we can tell. Like I, maybe whales have a special song that they're singing for a, a whale that's not there. I don't know. Um, I, I guess do know we can that... also call those things communication, like dancing that mm-hmm. it can right. be ritual sometimes, but it can also just be like a, a substitute for language to communicate. Mm-hmm. Which I think is so. We know <laughs> that all human, all Homo sapiens, are generally very good at communication. And across the world, across time, across cultures, whether it's big city or farmers or hunter gatherers or hermits, we all seem to develop some kind of spirituality, whether that's the kind of animalistic or shamanistic religion of the hunter-gatherers, or whether it's some organized doctrinal systematic thing in the cities, whatever it is, we seem to have this capacity. And we historically, anyway, seem to pretty reliably fall into that. So we also know that Neanderthals and now our, our most recent, recently discovered 
cousins, the Denisovans, have had the same capacity for communication, fairly certain that they had at least a comparable level of communication, enough that we have interbred with them significantly. And I, I think that if you have cross-population, cross-pollination that much, then and and Homo sapiens are so communal and so communicative that there must have been some level of shared experience between the two. That you know, so I I take the fact that our DNA is so mixed up in all of these different subgroups of humans that didn't survive to mean that we were able to form societies with them. And it probably wasn't all that big of a deal to them. I was just listening to an episode that dropped last week on origin stories from the Leaky Foundation. And they were talking about the Denisovans, which are a fascinating cousin of Homo sapiens that was only discovered in uh, the Denisovan cave or the Denisovan cave, depending on your accent, in Siberia, named so for the hermit Denis who just wanted to get away for a while and live in a cave. And <laughs> people have lived there for a long, long time. And they found a sliver the size of a jelly bean of the pinky finger of a child's hand. And through DNA testing, discovered that it is neither Homo sapien nor Neanderthal. And so this new species was classified. And just recently, just a few months ago, we found, I believe it came from a tooth, evidence that seems to suggest, and they did this experiment, she said six or seven times just to make sure it wasn't some kind of error, that this is a first generation child or somebody over 13, so she made it, whose father was Neanderthal and whose mother was Denisovan. And so this is a first generation hybrid huh. child that we what, have just what podcast is this? happened to discover. Uh, human origins. I mean, not origin stories. Origin stories. It's from the Leaky Foundation. It's a very good podcast. Okay. I would definitely recommend it to people. But it's pretty cool, yeah. right? The fact that we're able to sequence DNA has just opened up this this door, and we only have a couple of verified Denisi Denisovan fossils. But chances are, we have thousands of them. We've just not classified them as such. Uh, we have found that people among the aboriginals in Australia and some of the native peoples from Indonesia and some of the smaller isolated islands out there have really large percentage of their DNA comes from the Denisovans. And also people from Eastern Asia have a smaller percentage of that. But it seems that at one point, this subset of humanity spread over much of Asia and into Australia. And we're probably along living alongside the Homo erectus at some point. And so we've got at least those three. And there are some some other subsets, the um, Homo floriensis and some others that were isolated that we have found. And there's no reason to believe that there's not a dozen others that we just haven't discovered yet because hunter-gatherers don't leave behind very good, uh, well-preserved burial sites. They're not mummifying people. They don't have cities and 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 burial plots you know they're they're traveling and so they bury their dead and they move on and so it's harder to discover them but all that to say the cultural mixing that we see in the dna tells me that there was some ability to communicate values between them and we know that they had some way, some form of abstract thought because of their jewelry making and their painting and so I'm making the next leap to say that they probably had some kind of spiritual antenna. Um, I don't have evidence of that. I'm just inferring the next step because we see it in humans, Homo sapiens, I should say. I'm so I'm, I'm so prejudiced against other humans. I forget that <laughs> we're the only surviving human species, and so we can say humans, and we mean us. But we were not the only human species. We're just the last ones the lucky the ones. coolest the coolest ones right uh the looking most the, destructive ones <laughs> looking at the idea of the best suited for the environment um so every continent during the ice age during the the stone ages had mega fauna 
right? These, these giant sloths and huge horses and huge camels and enormous marsupials and woolly mammoths and just these amazing mammals. And, and they all went extinct within a couple thousand years of Homo sapiens discovering that part of the world. <laughs> So you can you can trace those extinctions just when we get there. We're not I wish very that we lived in a world good. that still had giant sloths. <laughs> can you imagine just like <laughs> snuggling up into a giant sloth's belly? That sounds <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> or like a forty foot marsupial and then you just <laughs> oh, climb into the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a dream. Mm. See, you have your Homo sapien ancestors to blame for that because <laughs> the Denisovans seemed to live fine with them in Australia until we showed up. Like, as you were talking, Zach, I was just listening to this story you're telling, and I became conscious of the fact that I said, that's pretty cool. And then 10 seconds later, I was just still listening to you, but thinking in my head, that's like the biggest understatement of the year, that everything that we know about these like human origins, and my response was, that's pretty cool. No, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so amazing that we can know any of these things. So I just want to correct for my understatement and <laughs> uh, recognize how incredible it is that we know that is fair. all of these things. That we can take something that is a 20th of an ounce and less than an inch and decide that it has a completely different Right, that it's categorized as a separate hominid, humanoid. Right, like Thanks, yeah. science. That's um, mm -hmm. that's it's incredible, breathtaking, breathtaking. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's just... that's what I love about science. <laughs> Super duper. Pretty cool. So that's those are the people that we can't uh, we can't ask because we killed them all, but uh -huh. we do have evidence of what seems pretty clearly to be religion among homo sapiens well before the dawn of of written language you know dating yeah. back to 20,000 years ago we have these idols that start to pop up all around the wherever humans were living at the time which were primarily focused in pockets it seems around fertile valleys in the middle east and in India and China and Africa and parts of Europe. Good climates and lots access to water. Right? Yes. Like societies thrive. Good climates and access to water. But we see these figurines start to appear. Yeah. And generally speaking, and almost without fail, they're women. Yeah. And they're also usually very exaggerated women. Yes. In terms of fertility purposes, we would assume. So you, these were like the size of your hand. We call them uh, Venus figurines, not because they were the Roman goddess, because Rome wouldn't exist for another 19,000 years or so, yeah. but <laughs> because Venus is uh, a voluptuous goddess. That's where women come from. From Venus? Yeah. Oh, and men are it's from Mars. Mars. Got it. You know, because I'm thinking here, like, I don't know, Venus. <laughs> Venus is, she... Um, it's the she hottest came, planet. She came out of the blood from her... <laughs> there you go. ...father's castrated penis that was thrown into the ocean. <laughs> and then she arrived in a seashell and... <laughs> <laughs> it is... That or is at least, not my birth story. No, <laughs> about, no, know, that's not how all women are made. Look, I'm I'm yeah. not a doctor. I, <laughs> yeah. They don't teach you that in seminary. <laughs> but what do you think of the fact that historically, anyway, archaeologically, it seems that the earliest idols were women, not big, strong male gods. Here too, I think we're making a leap that. 
the presence of an idol, which is, again, a, as you were describing, Zach, and which we'll certainly have pictures in the show notes, uh, as long with many other comments there, <laughs> about the size of a palm. They're usually voluptuous and voluptuous women who also have a very large belly, sort of indicating pregnancy, right? Which is sort of why we we do make the leap, which doesn't feel like such a, a large leap to make that it's about fertility. The idea of praying for fertility, I think, is different than praying to a god, right? So that the presence of the fertility is saying, this is what I want, is not the same as who you're asking. So you're saying that these are potentially more like lucky charms, like a rabbit's foot. Um, less like a rabbit's foot. Not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. I, I would see it sort of a, um, in the pantheon of Egyptian god and goddesses, each one has a role. And mm-hmm. the first one of those god and goddesses is the, that you say, this is the goddess that we're talking about, the goddess of fertility, because that's, that's the element that I need to work on. The rest of it will will happen and that right but the goddess of fertility is not the overall goddess or the overall highest being whatever that form i don't fully understand polytheistic religions in in a hierarchical sense because fertility is not just human fertility uh fertility is also making sure your crops grow fertility is also making sure that your animals are able to to breed and give you know provide you sus- substance in that way, so it's the ability for things to procreate is I'd say one of the largest deals and things that humans might pray for, but to whom is a, is is the giant leap to me? But it still does show a sense of spirituality or something along those lines, right? If not spiritual, that may not be the right word, mm-hmm. but some sort of. No, reco- I think it is. Yeah. Okay, so there's some sort of spiritual connection. I mean, I think you could maybe argue if if it's not like an organized type religion, religious practice, that there is probably there was probably some sort of spiritual connection to these idols in some way. Would that be a fair point to make, Zach or Rachel? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, well, you spirituality, have the- but not religion. You have the story in in Genesis of Jacob when he's he's with his his uncle and he is tr- tricked into marrying both of his cousins. <laughs> cousins. Is that yeah. small world? And when they they flee Laban and uh, is it Rachel that takes the gods takes the idols? Yes. And. That's seen as uh, as this great great problem because and she sits on them. Yeah, because you're not gonna you're not gonna go near that. If she's isn't that the one where she says like, "Hey, I'm on my period," and that's you don't want to come it. over here. Yeah. yeah, that's basically it. Wow, oh, Rachel. Well, it worked, but it was. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think they they believed that these these idols were a part of some great pantheon the way that we might think about the Greek and Roman gods right or even the later Canaanite pantheon it's more like the this was a protective spirit and these are the house spirits and yes. where these go there is protection and there is and so her taking that left him open and so I I think we're we're maybe putting the uh, cart ahead of the <laughs> Pegasus, as it were, in that we don't really have that same kind of highly organized religious system yet. So when we're talking about Paleolithic religion, we're mostly talking about localized, specialized kinds of vague spiritualities, because these are hunter-gatherers for the most part, and so their gods travel, or their spirits travel. And if, if you look at other cultures, like modern cultures that are hunter-gatherer cultures or that are native communities that are not influenced by these massive civilizations, they tend to worship spirits of the earth. They don't, they don't have well-delineated 
philosophical treaties for them. You've got the great spirits, the spirits of, of the sun and of the moon and of the harvest and the spirits of war and these these kind of spirits that that are in you and are in everything and and there are there are shamans who are able to to help you encounter these and it's very mystical this very experiential and very transitory like it moves it goes i, I think there's plenty of reason to believe that these these idols are evidences of that because if we see that sort of behavior today and we see evidence of these idols in the past, then I don't think it's too much of a leap to then say that this is what humans do. Um, and by the way, there was a, a Venus statue, Venus of Berachat Ram. I'm probably slaughtering that. It was discovered in Israel, dating between 230 and 700,000 BCE. So when I was talking about Venus statues from like, 20,000 years ago. Yeah, we're talking You're off by a factor of 10. We're talking those ones were really old. The ones that are more yeah, formed. When you said 230, really look, did you mean 230,000 to 70,000 or 230 to 70,000? 230 to 700,000. Cuz that's just a very wide range. It's a very long time ago. <laughs> human no, no, history. No, no. <laughs> but that's yeah, just Ian, the it's one. It's 200,000. 200,000 right. to 700,000. 700, Check. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Half a million yeah. years. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It is still, still a, a very, very long, long time. <laughs> yeah. The ones that I'm talking about that are more distinguishable, those are more recent, relatively speaking. <laughs> We're talking 20,000 years ago or so. Um, yeah. The ones that are super voluptuous and carved out of stone. And uh -huh. Well, so, but it does make you start to really think about when we find archaeological evidence to show some some sort of you know recognition of an idol or when you see the cave drawings and things like that about where all of that came from like what was the reasoning for all of that in the first place and it makes me think about at least now you know with humans that we like to try to understand things understand why things happen the way they do and so just to me that i just keep coming back to that idea that is was that their reasoning you know or could you say it was some big conspiracy where a, a bunch of people from each tribe got together and said, hey, this is what we're going to do, everyone, which I don't think that's the case. <laughs> but, um, you know, let's all come together and just freak out all of our people. Obviously, I don't believe that. And so, I, yeah, I think it's clearly a, a – to me, it shows, you know, is it – or my big question, I guess, is, is it evidence of those tribes and people's attempts to un better understand – What's going on? Does it does it point to a a unifying human condition of needing to look outside of ourselves and outside of that which we can sense in order to help make sense of the chaos in the world? This is this the thing that separates us from other mammals? Is this what makes us humanoid? Right. Right. Is I, I think that's that's more the question, not necessarily what we look like, right? In that we're we have no skills except for our <laughs> brains, right? We are we are very very poor carnivores, <laughs> <laughs> uh, slow, no claws, bad teeth, very soft, terrible teeth. Um, very, soft. Know, I, very soft, <laughs> squishable this time of year, especially. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but the ability for us to be in groups has created a massive advantage as we were just discussing, mm -hmm. especially between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. But when we really come down to it, right, lots of other animals live in groups as well. And they thrive on that. Even simple, right. Simple gnats. You, you never run into just one gnat. <laughs> <laughs> Life would be okay if it was just one gnat. Um, but swarms of them. So so just 
just that we get together in groups doesn't necessarily indicate our our difference between others. And our use of tools, we're recognizing that no, actually there are other primates and even some non-primates which use tools. So maybe it's not that either. And it's not our, our capacity for language, as we were just discussing, right? Communication is not just with words. And anybody who's ever had a conversation with somebody knows exactly what that means. Our our intonation, our body language is all of those things add up to more than words. The words are almost the least important part of our communication. So maybe it's not that. So is this idea of spirituality, which we'll leave it at that as opposed to just necessarily religion, which is a bunch of people deciding, yes, this pers- this spirituality is the one we're going with. But the idea that we can commune with, speak with, pray to perhaps, something that which we cannot see or experience with our five senses, is that what makes humans separate? Hmm. Have you read Sapiens? Yes, I have okay. not. Ah, but I well, know. I know that's of it. one of his. That's one of his major, major theses in there. That what sets hu- Homo sapiens apart is our ability to tell abstract stories that unite. Yep. yep. So that's why the Neanderthals could communicate, but they couldn't break past small groups. Humans, Homo sapiens, can tell stories that we all believe in, like commerce is just a story. (laughs) Um, PhDs are just a story, uh, an expensive story, but they're just a story. And all of society is based on stories that we all have agreed are true. And that's how we're able to- And valuable. And valuable. True and valuable, useful Mm -hmm. for what they're they're here for. And it's through that that we're able to- collaborate with in, in the millions and billions whereas neanderthals could collaborate with 50 right once you get beyond 50 you sort of lose you, you must create a different system once you get beyond about a group of 50 and right. neanderthals and just didn't have that skill yuval harari um he will then say that religion is one of those stories and spirituality is one of those stories and yep. that as homo sapiens expand and grow in numbers and we're we're having to uh, we're bumping into more homo sapiens we develop these stories in order to keep unity between groups and it's a way of creating society essentially that we create these these spiritual stories to create society and then when we tame agriculture that's when that's when religion really gets exactly kicked into high gear which you know anthropologically that's exactly what happens we go from these having little idols and when we start to settle down and make cities after we have domesticated wheat and grain about 10,000 10, years, years ago then that's when you start to see like religions as we know them today form. And they're no longer just spirituality. We're no longer just talking about shamanistic, animalistic kinds of, of, of spiritual expressions, but instead we have the great religions of Mesopotamia and then the ancient Near East, Stonehenge gets built, and then you get Buddha and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and all the, all the big names kind of all burst onto the scene after we have developed cities and we need bigger stories to hold more society together. And that's that's his hypothesis. And I have some issues with it, which I think we're going to go into detail in a future episode on. But I also find it terrifyingly compelling to an extent. And if I can be completely honest about that, his argument makes a lot of sense. And I look forward to talking about it in in the future because obviously we only have a few more minutes left and so we can't really uh, that's beyond the purview of this episode but it follows then the trajectory of these supposedly spiritual stories that we're telling each other 
and these experiences that we're having with something that we can't experience with our with our senses and describe rationally and it's developing into something more systematic once we have cities and writing and whatnot. But um, yes, I don't have a a great conclusion to that. Like I thought I <laughs> That's did. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's like you start on the train. You're like, I got this. I'll get to the caboose. And it but isn't is that gone. how religion is? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I don't know what that means either. That's like a fortune cookie <laughs> saying. Where you're like, that's not really a fortune, but at least it was a good cookie. But it's not they're really never a cookie good cookies. Either. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, as as we're coming into this conversation off of evolution, right? Off mm-hmm. of just even the concept of evolution, and we really looked at evolution as the ability to survive, procreate within a constrained environment. And so perhaps the way that religion, rather spirituality, has then had to evolve is because of the environments that we then created. Hmm. Right. I think that's I think that's where we're going with this. So when we look at the Paleolithic religions, this idea of the Venus figure that fits in the palm of your hand from yeah, let's cut the difference and say half a million years ago. And we go from that to Stonehenge, hmm. which do not fit in the palm of your hand. Maybe there's a rationale for that. Maybe there's a reason, an evolutionary reason for that. That again, not not saying one is better than the other. There's, It's just the best for the time and the situation that they're in. Um, which allows then for a myriad of religions to be simultaneous. So I'm thinking back to our our episode where we talked about the what was it, Kaya Wolf, the Wolf Odie, <laughs> the Wolf Odie. Um, I like that. <laughs> it's gonna catch on, right? Right, right. to your congressman, <laughs> dog, wolf, coyote. It has had to adapt, but at the same time, it didn't get rid of dogs, wolves, or coyotes. All three still exist, and now we have this fourth. Perhaps that can be the same for religion when we look at it. Wherever the person is, wherever the religion is, wherever their spirituality takes them, it fits their environment. And it's not necessarily right for everyone, but there's nothing that says one is better than the other. Yeah. Yeah. The conclusion that I had came to when I did this uh, presentation on, on this a couple of couple months ago was that at the end of the day i've come to five five main points when when looking at paleolithic religions at spirituality number one homo sapiens destroy everything we touch not new we've been doing it for tens of thousands of years so we're super good at it number two we are really good at working together the reason why we beat other hominids is that we're much better at working together. I mean, there's evidence of intercontinental trade 30,000 years ago between groups of sapiens that never met. (laughs) That's pretty great. We have this capacity for collaboration like no other species. Number three, religion was probably first used to unite disparate peoples and Mm -hmm. to bring people together in large numbers, despite the fact that nowadays religion is used to tear people apart and to further further isolate us from each other. Number four, what was going on with those early Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens? What were they doing? Can we say that they actually found some sincere connection to the divine? Or were they just mucking about for tens of thousands of years until God started hanging out in Israel? And you know, set this all in motion. I I don't think we can. I think we have to say, if we're going to affirm that God is moving through us today, then we have to affirm that God was moving through Homo sapiens and other hominids well before we had any concept of what God is. And number five, we need to rediscover humility. God doesn't belong to Homo sapiens. God doesn't belong to... Homo sapiens in the Anthropocene. <laughs> God belonged in the Pleistocene as well. And we need to be able to hold on to our 
beloved sacred stories while also allowing space for the expression of other sacred stories. And we just need to be okay with that. And I think that if nothing else, this should give us a dose of humility because we are not the first ones to discover the divine. And so we need to maybe take a back seat for a little while. And listen. And listen. This has been episode 21 of the Down the Wormhole podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, would you do me a quick favor and just share your favorite episode on social media? You know, all the ads and algorithms in the world are still not as powerful as a simple suggestion from a friend. You can find contact information, show notes, and more at downthewormhole.com. Join us next week as we take this conversation one step further, asking questions like, was religion just a tool used to hold the first cities together? Were big cities made possible because of religion? Do humans need religion? Is it time for a more inclusive human story? Those are some pretty heavy questions, and many of you might feel unsafe asking that kind of a question in your setting. So I sincerely hope that this podcast and the community around it feel like a safe and a comfortable place to explore. H how safe, Kendra? Like snuggling up into a giant slob's belly. That sounds so amazing. <laughs>